In these uh, very stressful times, it is necessary for all of us to control as far as we can the pressures in our own natures. Our reactions to outside circumstances can sometimes be so intensive that they endanger our health and damage practically every aspect of our social existence. There are all kinds of things that disturb people. One family I know was very much upset when there was crabgrass in the front lawn. It really assumed proportions. Another group of people are just about in collapse over the war in the Falkland Islands. Everyone is worrying about something. In many instances, this worry is probably legitimate. It can be justified, but it still is unhealthy. In some mysterious way, we must try to select for serious consideration only such items as can be meaningful in some way. If we cannot find any way of using attitudes or ideas for a constructive purpose, we should try to discipline them to the best of our abilities. A discipline in this case is not uh, frustration or inhibition. Discipline is not to tell us that we can't have any feelings or can't have any attitudes. Discipline is to make sure that as far as possible our feelings are justified, appropriate to the needs of the situation, and will in some way contribute to improvement. Those things which we can do nothing about, as St. Francis tells us, we have to endure as gracefully as possible. Those things we can change, we should give very definite thought to. But in thinking of change, we must be wise enough so that the change will be for the better and not for the worse. Now, in our daily affairs, there are three levels upon which we function. We function on a physical level, or in this case, let us say, mental physical. We then meant, uh, function on an emotional level and finally on a psychic or spiritual level. The physical level of our emotions deals largely with employment. We have to work, and our physical lives are disciplined by labor. It is very important that every human being should have a job of some kind, and that this work should be important to him for some practical or psychological reason. On the second level, it is very important that every person have adequate emotional outlets. The ideal outlet for the human emotion is the home, the family, and a close circle of related or friendly persons. The emotional outlet of the home is just as important probably more important than the mental physical outlet of the job. Above this is the third level, and that is man's relationship with his inner convictions, his beliefs, his religion, his church. This can be tremendously significant in the integrating of his own character. These three departments, the religious, the emotional, and the job, these three levels, must be kept in balance. We study people in various kinds of dis uh, disabilities and miseries, and in almost every instance, the law of the importance of these three levels has been either ignored or broken. The individual often feels that he must select between his interests. But when these three important dedications are considered, he must select all of them and arrange his affairs so that time and leisure 
will permit him to remain a well-balanced person. The balance is very often violated, and wherever it is, the whole personality suffers. The individual who either is lazy or indifferent or so wealthy that he doesn't have to work is violating the law of employment. He has to have a job. The individual without a job is in a very serious way. He has on his hands energies and specialized faculties which, if not used, will have a tendency to ferment within himself. If he is not employable because he does not need to work, then voluntary activities are indicated. He must take on causes or principles. He must find some way to adjust to the material way of living. Now, out of the job level comes a great deal of information that is not available to a person who does not work. On the job level, we find a great deal about social conditions. We learn a tremendous amount among, about the problem of management and employment. We understand manufacturing, we understand the layoff and the strike. All of these things must be faced on the level of employment. The person who is employed knows the problem and becomes increasingly subjectively aware of the conditions as they really are. He is not nearly so likely to develop a poor attitude on employment if he has passed through the job hunting and the job keeping procedure himself. So if he doesn't work and doesn't have the outlets, he is in a world in which work is not necessarily fashionable, but essential. And he is very likely to have a bad viewpoint about the whole field because he does not know it. He has not experienced it, and he can have a variety of opinions which are not based upon experience, but upon broadcasters and various commentators, books, and the complaints of his neighbors. He is not in a position to judge something he knows nothing about. On the second level, if the businessman, very much wound up in his economic re reactions and researches, neglects family, he is committing another serious offense against himself. He is opening his personal life to a great many emotional stresses and psychic disorders. He also can be working a very serious hardship upon his own physical body. Therefore, it is necessary, definitely, for him to keep a balance between his business and his home. Usually, one suffers. And this suffering can be traced to a series of circumstances in his own background, and the effect of this maladjustment is traceable in his physical condition, his uh, potential addiction to ailments, uh, emotional stress, and bodily fatigue and tension. So he has to keep this in order, and he has to balance. But otherwise, he is unable to actually understand, realize, or defend his attitudes on home life. He may be over-emotional, uh, he may be under-emotional. But the individual, as relationship to home is concerned, is in a bad way when he decides to depart from the home to escape its responsibilities and go off somewhere and be a loner. The only thing he really gains is a massive group of ignorances. He gives up a useful and necessary part of his own personality and in an effort to escape unpleasantness of some kind, he destroys the emotional balance within himself. Now, he may say that this emotional balance is compensated for by religion, which is the third level with which we are concerned. But a religion which compensates by taking a person away from his natural 
emotional responsibilities is not doing him any good. Religion is an idealistic background which will give the person courage to face the responsibilities he should meet every day. When he uses a religion as an excuse to evade responsibility, he is damaging himself. Now these three levels, all operating one with the other, and sometimes one against the others, this combination has a very heavy bearing upon the subject of the morning, and that is prejudice. What is a prejudice? A prejudice, for the most part, is an attitude held in the mind without recourse to any proof or actual demonstration of the facts involved. The most common prejudices are those against nations, races, and religions, but they may also extend to all levels of personalities, individuals we know or do not know. Today, prejudice is very strong on the political level, and we have a great deal of personal tension discomfort, and even illness arising from the constant nursing of prejudice. Well, most people looking over the subject are convinced that their prejudices are factual, that they are perfectly justified in not liking this or thinking that is very much better. But in the course of discussing these matters with highly opinionated persons, it is nearly always evident that knowledge, facts, evidence is lacking. There is not enough solid ground under an attitude. A prejudice is an emotionalized opinion. It is not necessarily the result of sober thinking and adequate information. Now, it may happen that all through life, or even by heredity, persons have prejudices. They have social prejudices. They are very prejudiced in matters of religion. They have all kinds of likes and dislikes which are more or less traditional, which are inherited from the past or cultivated under current circumstances. But wherever a very positive, definite opinion arises, the thoughtful person must immediately subject it to considerations. He must discipline himself against prejudice or against arriving at conclusions without the ability to support or the interest to confirm these conclusions. Supposing for a moment we say that an individual has developed a very serious prejudice. What is the disciplined thing for him to do? The disciplined thing for him to do is to find out, if he possibly can, the cause of this prejudice. Why does he feel this way about this, this person or that place or some other thing? Why does he instinctively jump at a conclusion? Well, prejudice, for the most part, is traceable to a personal experience that has not been wisely considered. The individual takes the attitude that he knows a person of a certain race or belief. He does not like that person. That person has failed in some way to live up to what he considers to be a proper standard. Immediately, the prejudiced person condemns the collective from which this individual arises. He assumes that a person who is not living his convictions actually is condemning his convictions, when in reality he is only a backslider in his own right. No individual can blame any group for the action of a single individual. It may be that the group does have problems, but also it is nearly always true that we likewise have problems. If therefore a prejudice arises, we should be able to say frankly and honestly 
that we have given every possible factual consideration to the matter, that we have made certain that all our facts are correct, that the individual or collective against which we are prejudiced in every way deserves our prejudice. If uh, it is true, then we are no longer prejudiced. We may have a like or a dislike, but it should never be based upon inadequate evidence. And today, this is the most prevailing circumstance that we have. And a great deal of prejudice is based upon the communication media. We are instructed to be prejudiced. We are given every opportunity to favor one cause above another, whether this cause is correct or not. But the person must go to work and settle the matter inside of himself. A violent prejudice held over a period of years can deform a complete life. It can cause the individual to leave out of his thinking a valuable bracket or a valuable element that could be useful to him if he would understand and accept it. This is especially true, perhaps, in the generality of religious prejudice. Religious prejudice was one of the most abstract and difficult of all fields of research, because regardless of the convictions of other people, it is almost impossible for one person to prove the other to be wrong. It is a matter held of opinion, it is a matter of acceptances or rejections. Uh, I remember asking one individual why he had such a dynamic dis dislike for a certain cause. He replied that it was because his whole family had always disliked that cause. <laughs> and it is true that in religion, various groups have been feuding for hundreds or even thousands of years. Persons born into these families inherit the feud. It becomes part of their daily life. And as a result of that, part of their inner emotional content is disfigured for the entire period of their lives. I know several cases of, of affirmed atheism arising in families where the parents had been heavily religiously prejudiced. Now, if there is uh, an interest in a subject, something should be done about it, and it should be done as carefully as possible. There's a story in England about a, an Episcopal clergyman who was on a campaign against astrology. It was his pet peeve. He did not know one sign of the zodiac from another. But he was completely certain that this our whole concept was against God, Scripture, and the common good. He kept on fighting, and he fought, and he argued, and he gathered what evidence he could to sustain his prejudice, until finally he ran out, he ran out of new material. And this being so, he decided the best thing to do was to attend some astrological activity, and find out some more things he could hold against it. <laughs> so he went three or four times and was silent from then on out, and before it was over, asked one of the astrologers to set his horoscope for him. <laughs> he was perfectly sure that astrologers were headed for perdition, but as soon as he met them and worked with them a little while, he realized that it had been prejudice all the time. Now, prejudices in religion are very dangerous today because of the present concern in the international peace and the desire to reconcile the differences of countries. There is no probable problem more uh, real than that of religious toleration. And a toleration, I don't mean an individual accepting it, knowing it isn't any good, but trying to behave in a genteel manner. Tolerance must arise from understanding. Those who have understood various religions generally find something in them that's worthwhile. But those who listen only to the prejudices of preachers or to their relatives who are opposed go through life cutting out of their existence 
one of the most valuable and beautiful of, its, of the specialties of living, the religious level. Today we have two and a half billion people, two and a half billion people who are all uh, more or less firmly addicted to religion. Yet these people cannot get together, cannot unite their efforts because of intersectarian differences. And at a time when a union in religion might turn the course of history, these people do not work together. The reason they do not work together is prejudice. The idea that one religion is true and all the others is false cannot be maintained. And those who have examined the subject carefully and have gone into it fully and clearly have found the same thing true that is reported of Dr. Max Muller, the great Orientalist, who translated or edited the 50-volume collection of the sacred books of the world, said that in, in examining the subject, he came to the conclusion there never was a false religion unless a child is a false man. Religions do belong in various levels, but all religious prejudice is not only a mistake, but is very hard on the digestive system. <laughs> it makes the individual irritable. It creates feuds. It limits acquaintances. It cuts down friendships. It does many, many things to restrict and narrow the life of the person. And the narrower a person is, the more likely he is to be prejudiced. So before deciding that anything is not right, you can place a, a measuring rod upon it. This measuring rod, fortunately for us, is available in all religions of importance. All religions teach essentially the same virtues. They have their Ten Commandments, very similar to our own. They believe in the same principles that we all believe in. Whether they are the East or the West, the differences are principally of language or bound into the personality of the leader or teacher. Therefore, with a common code of common sense, honesty, and ethics, the average person is in a pretty fair position uh, to judge the integrity of a religious belief. He knows that the religious person is intended and must live up to a, a standard of ethics, a series of internal dedications suitable to faith. Whether you are a Buddhist, a Brahmin, a Confucian, a Confucianist, or a Taoist, you are expected to be honest. You're expected to be kind. You're expected to meet the responsibilities of life faithfully and honorably. These types of things measure religion. And the individual has a right to measure the integrity of another person by his conduct and not by his creed. Now it may happen that the conduct of the individual isn't all that it ought to be. This has happened on numerous occasions. But if we can find a religion anywhere where all the exponents have been noble, we will find what man has never yet discovered. Every religion has its principles, those who obey these principles, and those who disregard them. So in, if we happen to meet a person who disregards his religious principles, we may feel that that person is not living up to his principles. But this does not mean that if he is a delinquent, that it means that his faith is wrong. He is, he is probably disobeying his own beliefs. And many of us in our own daily living, if we're not very watchful, disobey some of ours every day. So the individual never becomes the final justification for a collective attitude. So with a little care and a little thought, we try uh, to be understanding and patient. My old Methodist friend, Dr. Bronson, said on one occasion, it was his conviction that every person was doing the best he can for what he is. And it's that part about what he is that is sticky. Because each individual is a little different. 
he has more potential, more control, more integrity, more experience. Each individual is reacting according to the level, not of his affirmations, but of his conduct. So everywhere in the problem of prejudice, conduct is the thing that has to be very carefully considered. And conduct can condom condemn a person, but it cannot condemn a collective. An individual who is dishonest may be a bad example of his race or nation, but this does not mean that his race or nation is delinquent. Everything has to be thought through, measured through, and considered. Now it happens very often that people are sort of caught off guard. We have a busy day, we're a little tired, and something comes up and irritates us. We have had some minor difficulty with a person, and we therefore develop a prejudice. We go into a shop to buy something, and we have an unfortunate salesperson who is not courteous, thoughtful, or kind. So we leave and announce that we will never go into that store again. We have taken the clerk as an example of the entire establishment when a week later the clerk himself was fired by that very establishment for his discourtesies. We like to always generalize on a particular. And this is one of the great causes of prejudice. Now particulars are things that come under our own observation, things that we feel upon our own skin particular uh, things that actually happen. But unless we are well grounded and well rounded, we are unable to estimate the variety of particulars that can arise. If we have not proper integration in terms of discipline, understanding, insight, gent gentility, faith, humility, and understanding, if we lack these, then immediately we are in a position to pass a judgment which is prejudiced. The more evolved, the wider our lives are, the less prejudiced we are likely to be. The more intelligent we become, the more we are inclined to study people. Lots of times those who are the most prejudiced have never even read a book on sociology. They are not in a position to pass judgment, and the less right they have, the more apt they are to do it. So if a, we are experiencing in, in daily living certain unhappiness, a certain weakening of character due to the pressure of opinions, if we are rising too rapidly to an emotional crisis over uh, things we do not understand, then the problem is to get down and find out what the facts are. If we do that carefully, we will at least pass a mature and proper judgment. Our forefathers didn't have nearly as much of this problem to face as we do. Even 50 years ago, the communications media did not usually come into our home with the force that it does today. We were not required to pass judgments, or expected to. The individual lived within his own world. He lived in his little town, or he lived on his farm. He had a job. These things went on year by year, and had gone on for generations. Now it seems that every individual, intelligent and otherwise, is expected to come to tremendous decisions about world affairs, about the conditions of society. He is supposed to pass judgment upon the policies of nations, and he is supposed to decide whether a person is right or wrong, even though he may have difficulty in finding out the name of that person. It is just simply too much responsibility is thrown at us. The private citizen now becomes a member of what you might term a public senate, in which the, all different opinions have a right to be expressed, and the person with the strongest prejudice talks the loudest. 
Now, the, the cure for this, of course, is not only advantageous to the collective, but it is definitely therapeutic to the problems of the individual. The person who is constantly disturbed, particularly by things he can do nothing about or does not understand, it'll be in, is always in physical difficulties. Such a person is not a good business associate. A person that is highly prejudiced in the home is not a good member of the family. If these conditions continue, they disrupt all of the normal events of life and take away from the home the pleasures and pleasantries that should flourish there for the sake of the adults and the children also. Children may be very quick to pick up a prejudice, and as a result of a confusion, often it's come in later life to a mental or emotional delinquency. Now, in the uh, present way of thinking, we don't want to consider discipline as a frustration upon the individual. Discipline is not a real frustration. Discipline is a discovery of the workings of natural law in various problems. If the individual understands the laws of nature, he will realize what is right and what is wrong. He will instinctively cling to what is good and askew that which is not good. But every problem that exists arises in nature, and discipline reminds the person of the importance of finding out what nature would want to do about this particular situation. Art Norton, the famous Pharaoh of Egypt, uh, came to the conclusion that the sun, which to him was the symbol of God, shone equally upon all men. It also sent its benevolent ray to the friend and the enemy. It recognized no difference of race, religion, or culture. The sun brought forth the harvest of the earth for all who followed the laws of harvesting. The sun did not have any preferences, but human beings could frustrate the labors of the sun to some degree. If they turned a good farm field into a battlefield, it was not the fault of the sun. It was the individual who misused the energies and resources at his command. It is therefore very important that we all try to find out what nature wants us to do about various subjects. And then if we find this, we must have the courage, wisdom, and ability to fulfill what nature's desire actually is. Today in science we have a great deal of progress, but much of this is contrary to the will of nature. We are doing things by means of which we try to make man superior to his world. We try to take it for granted that the individual is in a position to reform space. He can't do it, but he's still hard at work trying to do it. Now this effort to do it without consideration uh, for the facts of life will indicate a limitation in the perspective of a scientist. This limitation is a place where prejudice can arise and which should be properly understood and disciplined. And wherever there is a short-sightedness, the subject should be investigated to discover its relationship to the universal plan of things. Man cannot contradict nature and remain happy and healthy. He must go with nature. And nature tells us all from the beginning that regardless of motivation, regardless of circumstances, we cannot hate anything and be healthy. Hate itself is a corrosive that will destroy anything. In the New Testament, we are warned of this. When Jesus said, love thine enemies. Today, we consider that to be very unsound philosophically, psychologically, economically, and politically. Therefore, we ignore it and we are sick ourselves on all those levels because we cannot break the rule. 
the individual who allows any form of negative animosities to grow within himself is subject himself, subjecting himself to a psychological cancer which will ultimately take over his complete mind and life and cause him to become a very disagreeable and ultimately a very lonely person. So realizing that we cannot harbor grudges because we are the one that suffers from this, not the person against whom we hold the grudge. I know cases where people have hated someone for a lifetime, and the person they hated never found out about it even. <laughs> this hatred, which was supposed to hurt the victim, only hurt the person who held it. It always comes back. Negative attitudes always return to those who send them. Negative thoughts always come back like birds to roost under our own eaves. There is no escaping this. So the only way to be healthy is to be fair, good-natured, kindly, and thoughtful. Now there are two kinds of uh, happiness. Well, absolute happiness, which is practically unobtainable in this world. And comfort, which is a reasonable condition of adjustment. The average person living in this world does not demand or require absolute happiness. And recent statistics indicate that about 75% of Americans are basically content. They are content because they have a job that helps them to take care of their families. They are content because they have a family they can be proud of, work for, or be unselfish in the cause of. They are content because they have an inner faith, either from their church or from their general internal acceptance of religious values, by which they can face the changes of the future. These comparatively well-adjusted persons do not doubt the problems of life, and very often sacrifice much to be of service to others. But basically, over a long spell of time, they are content, they are glad they're here in this world, they do not expect the impossible, they have no unreasonable ambitions, but they like to be busy, contented, dedicated persons. These individuals are the kind that, according to the scriptures, will probably have to inherit the earth if there are any of them left. So the beginning of our problem of uh, prejudice is to realize it is not necessary. The prejudices are deformities, not realities. They are things that we have to work with. And to work with, we have to outgrow. Now, discipline in this case is simply a resolution to know what you're thinking about to find out whether your judgment is good or not, and to try in every way possible to become better informed on any form of social contact with which you are involved. It is very important that the man who goes in to the election booth have something on his mind except the political party to which the candidate belongs. He should try to understand the values and problems. Now, one man I know had the answer to the whole thing. He wanted to be a very intelligent in appearance, so he alternated his X's. He X'd every other candidate, <laughs> feeling in doing this he had really shown individuality. Another one walked out without Xing anything. He was also expressing his individuality. But most people do not rationally work with the problems. They do not sincerely try to defend a way of life which they say they value. And lacking to the ability to find out something, or getting their information from a prejudiced source itself, uh, they uh, get the uh, family and perhaps the whole nation into trouble. So we have to try to find out how to neutralize any pressures that arise in us. One of the best things perhaps to do would be to keep a little record of uh, maybe a few weeks of daily prejudice. Whenever something comes up in which you have 
a very strong attitude? Do you have a strong background of facts to support that attitude? If you do not like something, do you know exactly why you do not like it? Do you also know whether you do not like it because it bothers you and you need it, or whether you are against it because of the weaknesses or faults within itself? Why do you dislike something? Do you dislike the idea of a person who wants you to do more than you wish to do? Do you resent an individual who tries to correct a fault which is obvious in you? Uh, do you uh, try your best to defend a false notion even after it is disproved by circumstances? Or are you one of those individuals who, having made a statement, and having the statement later proved to be untrue, F make, F makes every effort to forget it, ignore it, and refuse to give it any further consideration? All these things are important because they have to do with your ability to get along with yourself and most of all to get along in a universe in which obedience is the secret of success. Now persons who have no beliefs may or may not be expected to show deep philosophical responsibility. They do as they please and they get worlds into trouble as a result. But as persons interested in self-improvement, interested in ideal doctrines and beliefs, interested in the service of humanity, it is very necessary that we become disciplined in the sense of being able to be well informed on problems that are of immediate importance or value to ourselves or those around us. We should know our facts. And we should pause always to consider these facts and uh, be careful also in connection with family disputes to make sure that you hear both sides of the problem. I pointed that out to one individual who was having family dispute. I said, there are two sides. He said, of course there are two sides, mine and the wrong. So two sides do, doesn't mean that you're getting both sides of the story. You are perhaps, perhaps using the idea of both sides in an effort to disqualify one or both. To compare, weight, weigh, and measure means a completely open mind. Now an open mind does not mean a silly mind. An open mind is not one that accepts any notion that comes along and regrets it later. An open mind is a mind that is always ready to consider facts and give them precedence over opinions. Epictetus decided that opinion was the falling sickness of the reason. And that is exactly what it is and we're all loaded with it. So we have to try to overcome the tendency of opinion which stands between us and the way of nature and the will of God which is that we should do that which is true, and we support that which is true, and do not divide things into what are pleasant and what are unpleasant regardless of their integrities. So we say that it's a very good idea, and I think maybe most people will uh, find it possible, to take one or two uh, problems that you have, and which perhaps for a long time you have considered to be perfectly correct, and ask yourself in this particular instance under question, is my opinion kind? Is it constructive? Is it, a, is it an opinion that will lead to constructive consequences? Is it generous? Is it gentle? And is it the kind of an opinion that you would expect to find supported by the words of Christ? In this opinion problem, are you actually informed on this particular prejudice or this particular attitude? Are you really in entitled to it? And if you are not certain, then the thing to do is to become involved in the other side of the problem. If it is a case in which you have heard a report about a person who has said unkind things about you, 
probably the best thing to do is go right to that person and find out why. And if you find out that the thing they did not like is worthy of criticism, then your idea that they are opinionated is wrong. They are factual. Very often, adverse opinions relating to ourselves are indications of weaknesses that we should work with. But instead of accepting them and trying to work with them, we never speak again to the person who brought them. We do not want to be disturbed. And opinions are very fragile. And the need to defend them is obvious. Because we have to fight to defend them all the time. No one has to fight to defend truth. Because truth can have no defense and cannot be def defended or can it be defeated. It is. It does not require anything. But untruth has to be bolstered up every day. Untruth is like a bad diet program. You have to work with it every minute. Just try to stay on your feet. Therefore, the, ma the matter of, of the Gordian knot comes into, into focus. Where possible, take an opinion against a person directly to that person. You may get into trouble. They may never speak to you again. But that only reverses the situation because you don't intended never to speak to them again. <laughs> and the result is that in most cases, you go to lunch together afterwards. It is very easy also for people to develop prejudices because of the prejudices of others. The uh, fact that a statement comes to us does not necessarily prove it to be true. And of all the forces in this world that have created tragedy, even worse than dictatorships and wars and plagues, has been just plain, simple gossip. It is the greatest source of tragedy, I suppose, that has ever existed in the world. So we have to be very careful in judging things. We have to be sure that we have the facts. Now, if we have the facts of a situation, really have them, and know beyond any reasonable doubt that we have the facts, then we have to plan a campaign or a course of procedure appropriate to the need. If these facts offer an opportunity to be of service to another person and help them to correct the situation, that becomes our responsibility. We are not responsible for circumstances which have never been brought to our attention. But what we have thought about, meditated on, and come to conclusions about become our responsibilities. So we should do, try to do everything possible to correct the situation. If it arises from an incompatibility in which for the facts of the matter there may be no regular or real fault except a chemical compound that is not harmonious, if there is incompatibility then we should accept it as such and either attempt to be compatible by changing ourselves or recognize that we are of no value to the other person also, and therefore we will quietly, lovingly, and in a friendly manner no longer create the condition which brings about the tension. We we'll just discontinue an association that is not feasible, practical, or useful. But in all of it, a very kindly, friendly attitude. If we are in the presence of persons who are making mistakes, we can criticize, but we can also be sorry for them. We can wish we could help them, and sometimes perhaps we can. But prejudice nearly always results from failure to do anything constructive. It is merely continuing the old way of hatreds that have brought the world war after war, have broken countless homes, led to numerous inquisitions, and have destroyed the peace of mankind since the beginning of history. As we go on into a religious point of view, we must outgrow these things or we will perpetuate them. Recently, the situation in Iran indicates that religious intolerance is still present, but it is present because of ignorance. And it is because of collective ignorance that Iran is in trouble. And it is because of private and personal influence or conditions that the individual who is religiously intolerant is in trouble. Now, religious intolerance does not 
justify itself. I just cannot accept that deity wants us to remain ignorant of every belief except our own. If there wasn't a reason why different beliefs are necessary, it seems unreasonable that heaven should have produced them in the first place. Yet we know that all over the world people have received religious revelation, that it has become tremendously important in their lives, and that when they have lived it, it has brought about a great improvement in their own characters and in their own uh, lives. Maybe some of you recently saw the new picture that has come out on uh, Marco Polo and uh, the Mongol Emperor Kublai. On the back of an elephant in the uh, heart of Mongolia, Kublai Khan, back in those days, declared religious tolerance to all his people. And he said that if any member of any religion persecuted, defrauded, damaged, or downgraded the member of another religion, he must be severely published and punished by the state. Now that was long ago, but it was a sign that was valuable. The Indian Emperor Ashoka, who was a... a more or less a warrior pagan was converted to Buddhism and then established his uh, country on religious principles. His throne at Farapachikri in India is on the top of a column and on the four sides of the column are bridges going out to four uh, subsidiary thrones. On one was seated a Brahmin priest. On another was seated a Buddhist priest. On the third was a Christian priest, and on the fourth a Jewish priest. And these were the counselors of state. In isolated instances, the great facts have become evident. But we are still much limited by prejudice. Now, it is wrong, I think, also to proselyte. I don't think that we should try to take people away from their faith. But if we can help them to enlarge their understanding of their faith so that it is of greater help and strength to them and leads them closer to a life of useful contentment, then we can perform a natural and proper service. All through life, uh, prejudice destroys our right to serve. That which we are prejudiced against, we do not help. We do not help to improve it. We do not help to correct the various faults which we feel exist there. So all through life, in science, art, literature, music, everywhere, the prejudice problem must be understood. Sometimes it is plain jealousy. We are jealous of those whose accomplishments appear to be greater than our own. We are jealous of those who are more successful and uh, rise higher in social situations than ourselves. All kinds of causes can lie behind uh, this prejudice. And the only way that we can solve it is to examine into ourselves. Find out what makes us tick. Find out if we possibly can why we think the way we do and feel the way we do. And then measure up very quietly the attitude we hold with the spiritual convictions we claim to believe. The uh, greatest difficulty we have at the present time is that religion, though it controls in many ways probably 75% of humanity, has never recognized the inevitable need of practicing the virtues of faith to forgive and forget. There we remember the lawsuit problem in which individuals go to litigation without a moment's pause. They should remember the words of St. Paul who had the answer for that. Forgive thine enemy quickly while thou art on the way with him. Because if you don't, he'll drag you into court. Now these things, we can use the Bible very successfully to find out 
how we can react to the circumstances of our own of our own existence. Most of those of us who have gone into religion rather deeply and have made the, the faith of man part of our study and purpose for life have a fair knowledge of the beliefs of, the, of others. And we realize that these beliefs must be measured on the terms of the integrity which they have. And the follower is measured by whether or not he maintains the highest level of the faith he does accept. We are not in trouble nearly as much because we believe the wrong things, but because whatever we believe, we do not do the right things. So we encourage every person uh, to a analyze himself using his spiritual convictions, the beliefs that are closest to his heart and mind as the basis of self-analysis and find out what the good book would say about the attitude he is taking on almost any particular condition. Now, this means, uh, for instance, that there are lots of small things that will help to guide our direction. I know that people who get very excited, I've known several, uh, complain afterwards of headaches or stomach aches or go down into the dumps or have all kinds of remorse mechanisms. Now these arise partly from chemistry, because the individual who breaks rules, whether he knows it or not, is punished. He is punished by the body, which is one thing he cannot com convert to anything. No matter how hard he tries, the stomach remains the master of itself, and to a large degree the general secretary of his life. There is no power in the world by which the individual can cause the processes of elimination to be changed by an attitude except for the worse. So knowing the facts of these things, we have rules and guides. If at the end of a temper fit we are miserable and share our miseries generously with those around us, then this is something we shouldn't have, because misery is not an asset. It is not a virtue, and even in the most desperate circumstances, it is not commendable. Now, supposing, however, you do come upon someone or something that is really bad, that every evidence, every thought, every research you can do indicates that this person is undesirable, that they are a troublemaker in themselves, or they have refused to recognize any uh, standard of integrity. Now, you have no right, perhaps, to pass judgment on them, because even under these conditions, if you were in their place and had the same background, circumstances, and heredity that they had, you might have done the same thing. But the problem now remains is that having discovered something that is essentially wrong and realizing that it's not curable, then the best and simplest answer is to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with that person and set the matter straight. If they are not doing the right thing and they know it as well as you do, then you have a perfect right to accept uh, either an apology and an effort to improve or simply to disassociate yourself with them. But this does not mean that you have a right to damn them, that you have a right to condemn them, have a temper fit, scream at them, shout, and throw them out the front door. You should quietly and holding your own integrities intact give righteous judgment in a gentle, kindly way, always regretting that it will not perhaps be effective. But no one in an emergency has a right to go down on the level of another person and scream and shout at them. These things we have to gradually discipline ourselves against. Because very often uh, prejudices lead to anger, and anger may even lead to physical violence. But in every instance, the thoughtful person must control themselves. They must try in every way to commit no evil in the presence of a strong inducement to commit evil. So if you can't make it work, if it doesn't solve itself, if the problems are not reasonable, then the only answer is to close off the situation, wishing no one any harm, 
but refusing to become part of a condition that is going to remain incompatible indefinitely. Now this is one of the problems that arises also in the home today. And home life is getting to be a matter of a considerable amount of prejudice. It is now becoming increasingly evident that the home is fragile and that the various attitudes of persons uh, are more or less incompatible with natural law regarding, regarding the home. Now what is the actual basic principle upon which a home is based? A home is based upon a pattern that it comes from heaven itself. It is something which is justified and authorized by the divine plan of things. Every form of life must have some form of home or security or some basis of operation. And it is also indispensable to the perpetuation of every species that exists. Home also is a psychological experience of the greatest value because home is the p most positive opportunity for the maturing of the emotional life. If our minds are uh, cleared and deepened and integrated by a course on computers, uh, the emotional life is really receiving the postgraduate course of education in the home. The home is the challenge. It is also the laboratory for the release, integration, and ennoblement of the emotional quotient in human nature. The home, therefore, is a challenge, and it has much more to do with growth than we are likely to assume. To many people today, the home is just simply a place to sleep or a place in which to change your clothes or a nice quiet spot to watch television. The home is not what it used to be. Perhaps it never was, but we like to think it was. But one thing is certain, that the maturing, developing, and ennobling of the home is one of the laws of heaven. Confucius summed it up in a very simple statement 25 centuries ago when he said, the strength of a nation depends upon the integrity of its homes. All public institutions, all world events, all human achievement and, and failure must trace back directly to the home. The home is the earth from which the seeds of achievement grow. The home is the solid ground upon which empire can be built. When the home fails, the world fails. So with this thought in mind, it becomes a great place for philosophical insights, for discipline. And discipline often requires something that we do not like to admit. And most people are very reluctant to allow for it. And that is the dignity of opinions that differ from our own. Must we always feel that it is necessary to convert somebody to something? Why can we not have families in which differences of opinion on secular matters or even on theological matters do not interfere with the integrity of the home or the affection of the members? The reason why we have trouble in this is because of the missionary instinct. A religious uh, conversion in a home is a mistake. The thing that is important in the home is to quietly decide whether or not whatever we believe we are obeying it. And that religion means the use of our insights, our spiritual insights, to discover the identity of the deity in all of us. The home is a perfect place in which the individual can come to realize the indwelling God to be found in the family, in the relatives and friends, and in the associates in the environment. In the home, the God of all peoples comes to dwell in each one of the members of that family. And when one turns against the other, he turns against the God in the other. So if people are living well, doing well, thinking well, there is no reason why interreligious marriage 
and in many instances interracial marriages cannot succeed. They represent very often, however, uh, a problem in which prejudice confronts realities and overwhelms them. So whatever it is, the home is very important. And in the home, every value that is essentially religious comes into focus. A home is a place in which parents learn their responsibilities for their own children. They learn the responsibility of giving life and protecting life. They have experiences that cannot be found anywhere else or in any other part of nature. But these experiences are very close to God, very close to truth, and are most ennobling experiences in human life. Where affections can be brought into a disciplined relationship, where affections work out in beauty, in integrity, and in highest convictions and beliefs you have as near a perfect situation as you will find anywhere in the human state. Therefore, we may say that every good home is a chapel, and every poor home is a ruined church. And this we have to try to do what we can about in order to help protect the future and make a better world for all of us to live in. But here again, prejudice must be overcome. Here, the desperate determination to change somebody's point of view must be overcome. The only thing we have a right to hope to change is that help hope to bring the individual closer to his own convictions, the best of them. And uh, argument is useless. The only ex the only good teacher in home relationships is example, and the example of gentleness may be overlooked. It may be rejected, but it is the duty of the individual who has constructive convictions to live those convictions kindly and gently, hoping continuously that they will assist the other members of the family to a better relationship with life. So prejudice, in another sense of the word, is an emotion against God. It is an emotion against the deity in ourselves. It is an emotion against any religion, philosophy, or science that is worth anything or worth bothering with. A prejudice is something that is usually a defense mechanism. It is an effort of the individual to overlook, deny, or escape from his own mistakes. And it is very essential that he accept the fact that he has these prejudices and go to work and clear them out. At the present time, we are much worried socially about conditions in the world. And practically all the unhappiness that is in present society is derived basically from some form of prejudice. It is prejudice against truth. It is the unwillingness to see the truth in the beliefs of other countries, even though we expect them to accept our truths. It is a tendency for each nation to try to impose its own rules, doctrines, and beliefs upon other powers, when the proper course of procedure is to inspire each, power, each nation and country to release the best part of itself. Every nation involved in trouble today, at the moment at least, has some religious background. Many of them are devoutly religious. And yet their various religions are not producing the effect that is necessary. People are not able to live up to the convictions they hold. And this is largely excused by turning animosity upon another person. If we do not want to change, we make the other person wrong and insist that our own point of view is correct. If we do not want peace in the world, we will always blame another nation for causing war. If we have trouble in the business, our tendency is to assume that somebody else is delinquent, dishonest, or inefficient. We do not accept the challenge of trying to do the thing through greater insight ourselves. We must try as far as we can, we're all limited, but we must try to get rid of this whole problem of being prejudiced through constant watchfulness, through a continuous 
uh, application of thoughtfulness. Now, another simple attitude on this is if we read newspapers or if we listen to commentators or news broadcasts, uh, we should be very, very quiet. The quietness in this matter does not mean approval. It means attention. It means that as we hear the news, we think about it. We do not allow the commentator to think for us. We do not allow the news analyst to overwhelm our own judgments. We do not allow political differences to prejudice us against facts. We uh, find somewhere in the program something we don't quite understand. We don't understand why it should be that way. Then the point should be given further consideration. If necessary, read a book about it. But sure, be sure that you are not making up a mass mind that is being under very strong propaganda. Do not allow other people uh, to disturb you unless you are sure that they are right. And then if you are sure that they are right, you probably will not be disturbed. You will decide in your mind what should be done and how it could be done. It is very, very necessary to escape this pr constant pressure of prejudice. Commercial advertising is loaded with it. And most products are subtly trying to prejudice you, prejudice you against other products. Each one is trying to tell you that it's better than all the others. And we go along with it as we would a game, because we all have a general realization that the different products may all be made by the same manufacturer and simply be labeled differently and sold competitively to create a little more action. So we should learn these things and not uh, allow uh, prejudiced attitudes or prejudiced institutions to get in under our common sense. No prejudice can stand common sense. And common sense is man's most uncommon sensory perception. It is judgment. Common sense is the ability to see the facts after they have been carefully ca camouflaged for private interest. Prejudice is not uh, a virtue. Loyalty to mistakes is not justified. All loyalty must be to that which is the greatest good so far as we are able to know that good. Never are we presumed to assume that patriotism to a prejudice is a, is a legitimate virtue. It is not and never can be. So uh, all of us, I know every day we come upon these things. For one reason or another, somebody runs down another person because they'd like to have their job. Another one runs down something else because they r really want to have their own opinion come first. And I know a great many persons who run down the Ten Commandments because they object to them. Now, objection in the, for, in the study of natural law is vanity. There's nothing that is less productive than an effort to object to values as they really are. We cannot reject or object in matters relating to divine laws. We have to realize that the miseries and sorrows of this life we know of are not due uh, to the tyranny of deity. They are due to the fact that we do not obey the laws of creation which not only did deity bring into existence but must obey himself. So that uh, we have no right to be prejudiced against God and become an atheist. And uh, even uh, Robert Ingersoll, who was well known as an atheist, admitted that he wasn't really an atheist. He was an agnostic. He said, I do not object to God. I don't know anything about God. But I certainly do object to some of the people who claim to know about God. He said, I object to faiths and doctrines which will build beautiful cathedrals 
uh, in, up into the air and dungeons underneath to imprison and torture human beings. And I don't object to deity. I don't know what it is. But I do object to the way that religion has divided, broken up, and fought among itself, among itself for centuries. And I think we all have that same problem to face to a degree. We have prejudices against religions, but they are prejudices against persons who have perverted and misused these religions. There is no really and no need for us to give up anything that is good. There is no need for us to use religion as a means of evasion. We are not here to use our religion as an escape from our daily jobs. We are here to use our religion as an inspiration to ensoul honest labor and virtuous life and make it help to advance our eternal dignities. Now, when we do depart from here, wherever we go, uh, we are going to perhaps come into a realm that we're not too familiar with here. We do not really know all about what's going to happen in the future. We might go over there and find some of our prejudices are all wrong, but it may be too late then to do very much about them. We may also find over there something that we must all learn over here if we want to succeed in life, and that is that there is a wonderful universe, that this universe was created by a divine spiritual power, and that this power has created all things with love and wisdom and has given to each of his creatures a measure of that love and wisdom. And of the creatures that we know, man has been most richly endowed with that love and wisdom. And through the love and wisdom of that which created us, we shall find the way of our own redemption. We shall be redeemed and brought back to the truth of matters by the wisdom and love of the divine within ourselves. The manifestation of that wisdom and love, as in the case of deity, is certainly patience. For the universe has gone on for an inconceivable period of time under the continual love and wisdom of deity. All things are fulfilled in their due times. Patience is a great virtue. And by patience we shall all achieve if we constantly watch our ways. If we continually use time as a way of growing, if we use experiences as a way of discovering God, if we use our acquaintances with other people as ways of enlarging our understanding of life, and if we simply say prejudices have no place in this, that we, must, we cannot afford to be prejudiced against God or against each other. We are here to overcome all false opinions by the illumination of our inner lives. That on the outside may cause prejudice. On the inside reconciles all things in affection, friendship, and wisdom. And we can start here then to use our cooperative faculties rather than our competitive faculties in estimating the values and virtues of mankind. Well, I guess that's all for this morning. <laughs>